Hi everybody, it's Fabrizio Poli here from BizJet TV. Today we have Ziad Abdenur with us, the president and founder of Black Hawk Partners in New York, who's going to be talking to us about business in general, but above all also the geopolitical situation and what's going to be happening in the business world in the next few months. Ziad, welcome to the show. My pleasure, Fabrizio. Good so, to be here. So what, uh, what's your view on the geopolitical situation? How do you think what's moving now, what's happened with North Korea and other things that we've seen already this year, uh, how do you think this is going to develop over the next few months and into 2019? Well, I'm, uh, it's a very complex world. Uh, lots of rising poles of influence. You know, 10 years ago, 10, 15 years ago, the US used to be the sun now it's only a planet among other planets emerging russia china india emerging markets etc mm -hmm. so it's a much different world much more complex world uh, technology is catching up with everyone yeah. even the remote places of africa mm -hmm. you know where a lot of them have even cell phones yeah. so you know uh, information and power is going is basically trickling down in a massive way. Mm -hmm. People are becoming much more aware. Uh, the elites are shaking, not just the US elite, global elites. Uh, it's a different world. And I really think, and I wrote this in my book, Economic Warfare, five years ago, mm -hmm. and I warned of that, this trend happening. Uh, a number of uh, elitists like Zbigniew Brzezinski and others warned about that too. So it's going to be a much more complicated world where people need to uh, uh, have their voices heard more and more. Uh, and also a much wealthier world, believe mm -hmm. it or not. I yeah. mean, for the first time I was reading this morning, Hong Kong has surpassed New York as the place with the most millionaires, 10,000 more millionaires in Hong Kong than New York. Mm -hmm. So uh, the poles of influence are changing, but yeah. also the U.S. Uh, under the Trump administration is catching up very quickly and rising as a major force, both economically, politically, militarily, everything. So I see more friction, uh, but not, not necessarily wars. I don't see wars. Mm -hmm. I think we're going to find a way to contain North Korea, to contain uh, Iran, to contain all of the rogue states. You know, and today uh, the levers of power are used differently. You don't have to bomb somebody to death to, to basically cripple him. You can cripple him through sanctions, economically, etc. Uh, so in the short term, I'm, I'm pessimistic. I think it's going to get worse before it gets better. Mm -hmm. In the longer term, I'm very optimistic in the longer term. I see a very bright future, very bright world. Uh, with more equality, with more access to opportunities, with more business opportunities, etc. But right now, you're going to have this friction, and you are having this friction um, among different points of influence. That's the general view. Of course, we can go into detail, into everything, but that's the general view. Power is shifting drastically, uh, which I think is going to be for the better. I mean, there is no... I mean, even the minorities, even the people in Africa, the poorest people are having access to all that stuff, which is good for the long term. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, business now, obviously, you said short term, it's going to get worse, then it's going to get better. Uh, what yeah. sectors do you think are going to start to really thrive in 2019, 2020? Um, and which parts of the world do you think someone should be going into with their private jet to do business? Okay, we'll talk about the private jet a bit later, and I'll tell you exactly my opinion on that. But in general, before talking about the private jet, yeah. I really don't look, uh, Fabrizio, I really don't look at industries or themes or geography. I look at people. Yeah. It's all about people. Mm -hmm. People who can execute. You know, and you know, there are all kinds of people. Entrepreneurship is not reserved to the United States. Mm -hmm. You know, there are entrepreneurs in Europe, in Asia, in the Middle East, in Africa, everywhere. Mm -hmm. So basically, you have to look at to watch carefully who are the rising stars, who are the people under 30 who are making a dent rather than what industry is doing this and that. Because all the industries are at the end of the day, you know, run by people, 
run by people with the, with the passion, with the know-how, with the access, with everything. Mm -hmm. So that's how we invest at BlackRock. We look at people. Yeah. I never look at trends. Mm -hmm. uh, now, of course, there are some industries which are more scalable than others, obviously. Mm -hmm. And I tend to focus on those industries that are not very capital intensive, but that are scalable. You know, because this is what I look for in business, number one. Mm -hmm. People with a track record, people with skill in the game, industries and businesses that are scalable is the name of the game. Now, if we're talking about the jet industry, you know, which is absolutely a concern. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I was uh, reading an article some time ago from some real authority showing you how wealth has shifted. Let me know that. The average jet owner in uh, Europe is 57 years old. Mm -hmm. The average jet owner in the United States is 46 years old. The average jet owner in Asia is 34 years old. Yeah. This says it all, Fabrizio. Yeah. This says it all. How, and, and, and uh, so I'm not surprised that Hong Kong has surpassed New York yeah. in terms of wealth. And you see it in the numbers of the average jet owner, the average Ferrari owner, the average luxury items owner, whereby the, young, the youngest are in Asia and the oldest in Europe. I don't know, they haven't done a study in the Middle East or Af yeah. Africa. <clears throat> so, where do I see this? Well, you know what? Speed is going to be very important. Mm -hmm. Everything now is super jet that goes from New York to LA in two hours. Yeah. Luxury is very important. Mm -hmm. Look at the, when you go to a, a, an Emirates airline and others, the luxury you see there, yeah. even the private yeah. jets. So, you know, convenience, convenience, time is money. Yeah. Time is money. We have a limited time on this earth. Yeah. Whether well, it's fast, whether well, it's a luxurious way, whether well, it's cost effective. So, I think we're moving more towards this trend. Faster and faster. Yeah, yeah. F speed, obviously, is what the private jet gives you. It gives you flexibility. And going into you know places like Africa, it's difficult to go in and out. If you're going to do like a three city uh, trip to Africa, uh, doing it with yeah. the airlines could take you like ten days. Um, yes. Well, the private jet you can do it in 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 three days, um, and that's where you know these emerging economies are, are going to going to play. But the other interesting thing I discovered is if you look at the top schooling systems in the world, where where, where students uh, students are excelling in education and that, the top five are actually all in Asia. Uh, yeah. Japan, Hong Kong, Vietnam. So, so it's interesting to see that, 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 that there's a, there's a correlation there between you know education and uh, what you just said, private jet ownership. Private jet ownership in Asia, thirty four years old compared to fifty seven in Europe. That's a big difference. That's a generation. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah, yeah, great. So, how do you think? Uh, uh, I mean, in your view, how how do you think the business jet is going to be a great advantage for for these people? I'm telling you, it's speed, convenience, luxury, availability, affordability. I mean, even now the jet industry, I mean, renting a private jet is becoming affordable yes. to a lot of people. Yeah. I'm not talking about the super, super jet. I'm talking about in general. Yeah. So I see more of this trend, you know, happening. It's going to be a smaller world, a more connected world, and jets make the connection. Yeah, because they, they, they reckon there's another 2 billion people coming on the internet in the next three to four years. And, and they're going to come on the internet with a smartphone that's got 5G capability. So yeah. now they're immediately on the internet. They're connecting with you and I and other people around the world. And you get to a certain point where a Skype call isn't enough. You need to get on a plane and meet and shake hands and go for lunch. like Absolutely. Lunch. Uh, when we met the first time in New York a few years ago, um, you know, you, you, you can only do so much through technology. Then you need to meet in person. You need to walk the ground. I'm, and, and I'm an old-fashioned guy. I'm an old-fashioned guy. I need to meet face-to-face -face and shake and uh, meet people eye to eye. Yeah, and I think, I think what, because a lot of people criticize years ago, they said that technology and the internet were going to kill the, the airline and private jet no. industry. But that's not happening because at the end of the day, people need to meet people. Uh, but what I think technology is doing, it's making meetings more effective.
because I can have 25 calls with people via Skype and then choose the three to have meetings with and then go and spend time with those three people instead of going out and visiting all 25. So I think technology is helping things be more effective. And that's what the private jet really does. It, it makes things more effective. Yeah, you know what? I see the competition for uh, uh, planes in 20 years time, or even less, is flying cars. Yeah also, yeah, also Elon Musk is looking at using rockets to fly people long distance. So you would fly like Vancouver, Shanghai in 30 minutes with a rocket with 100 people on board. Yep. And then they, yep. it would land vertically and then refuel and take off again. So you'd be able to use this rocket like four or five times a day. The cost of rockets obviously is, you know, it, it costs so much money to use a rocket. But if you can use a rocket four times in one day, with 400 different people paying a ticket, you're going to bring the price down and you're going to increase the speed. Um, and so, yeah, I agree with you. But the flying cars on the short distance, the electric flying cars, that's going to be a big game changer. Um, yes. I, I can definitely see that coming. Um, yeah. And that's going to be a good, a good thing. Fascinating, fascinating times we live in, Fabrizio. Yeah. Tell, tell, us a bit about, tell us a bit about Financial Policy Council because I know you're very active with the Financial Policy Council. We've worked together uh, with the Financial Policy Council. And I know you've got some new events coming up in the new year. Uh, can you tell us a bit about the Financial Policy Council and, and, and what the, the plan is for next year so that those that are watching may want to sort of come come along and, and attend at one of the events? Which, by the way, everybody that's watching, they're fantastic events, great speakers, great people. It's definitely, if you're, if you're in New York at that time, you need to go in to see Ziad and his people at the Financial Policy Council. Over to you, Ziad. Tell us a bit about it. Thank you, Fabrizio. Well, uh, we do events every six weeks. Uh, we basically are becoming a forum for entrepreneurs uh, of all walks of life. We're making a difference. Uh, you know, we have already honored and featured like a dozen entrepreneurs. We, we're going to do much more aggressively going into next year. Uh, every event is around an asset class we talk about whether real estate, emerging markets, healthcare, cryptocurrencies, you name it. Uh, we're gonna have, we're gonna conduct a couple of events from now till the end of the year. One of them is on smart cities, you know, mm -hmm. very hot topic. Yeah. The other one is on branding, you know, how you brand your product, your services. Mm -hmm. So, you know, at the end of the day, when we talk about, about each of these asset classes, we talk about how do you make money in that asset class? Mm -hmm. Financial Policy Council is a forum for wealth creators and deal makers. It's a club for how do you uh, make money, how do you create value for them to interact and to benefit from the process. We're not a, we're not a think tank or, or, or non-profit just for, to talk about academia. I never invite on the panel people who don't have skin in the game. I strongly believe if, if, I, if I listen to people, I want to make sure that these people who are telling me something have skin in the game. If not, they're pontificating without anything to back. This is why I rarely listen to academics, economists, etc. I mean, they can tell you theories about what they think the market is going to be. But as long as you don't have skin in the game, I mean, this is why, look, look at yourself. You're in the jet business. You have skin in the game. You operate these jets. You've invested in these jets. You understand the business. You know the risks because you have your money where your mouth is. Yeah. And this is what the Financial Policy Council tries to do, to promote uh, wealth creators, capitalists, people who think this way. I really think over the last eight years, we forgot that. A lot of it was relying on the government, relying on handouts, relying on other people helping you. I think this trend is back now with the Trump administration. Uh, self-reliance, Ayn Rand type of philosophy, mm -hmm. individualism, mm -hmm. uh, creating value, stuff like that. This is what the Financial Policy Council embodies. You know, bringing all of these people, uh, inform them, educate them, empower them, and uh, provide them with opportunities to make money and create wealth. Okay, Thanks great. Yeah, so what, what events do you have planned for next year? You, you, when they start in March, is it, next year? Yeah, we start in March. Uh, we're planning to, uh, to co-host a few events in, uh, with other organizations similar who have the same philosophy in Las Vegas, in the Bahamas, in Los Angeles, in Washington, D.C. Uh, the three markets we focus on most are the triangles, Silicon Valley, Washington, D.C., and Wall Street. This is where we believe 
are the, the most aggressive people who are making things happen, whether in technology, in finance, or in politics at large, mm -hmm. you know, which is the cement between technology and finance. So we tend to emphasize on these, mar these markets, create events and venues in those three markets, and bring about, you know, tons of entrepreneurs to talk about this. We want to be, you know, look, there is no organization in the United States that empowers, embodies the entrepreneurs like the Flash Policy Council. The entrepreneurs, frankly, are, are, are looked at in general in disdain. You know, these guys are rebels. Yeah. These guys are mavericks. You know, they don't conform. Yeah. You know, we, we like those kind of people because those kind of people are the people who change the world, are the people who don't conform, are the people who are different. You know, and this is what makes it. A, so we try to, uh, you know, to provide them with awards, to empower them, to, to, to provide them with venues, to talk, to educate. Because at the end of the day, you have to rely on yourself. You have to be a self-sustaining cash machine, mm -hmm. money machine. If you're not like this, you're not going to go very far. You can't count on uh, the company you work for because you don't know if 10 years from now the company is going to be in business. Mm -hmm. you, can't, you cannot rely on the government. Yeah, you can get some breaks, tax breaks here and there, but this is not a reliance. You have to rely on yourself. You have to build your network. Your network is your network. Mm -hmm. You have to build the proper relationships. You have to acquire the skills. This is what the Flash Force Council is about. It's basically educating, empowering, informing, and, and creating venues for wealth. Yeah, great. Tell us a bit about Black Hawk Partners, which is your company, and uh, and, and and what you you've been up to lately, uh, just so that those that are watching can can know a bit more about but your your company and your business ventures. Yeah, I mean Black Hawk Partners is a family office. We do two things, and we do them very well. We are private equity investors, and we are physical commodities traders. On the private equity investment, we basically invest in private companies that are not listed, as long as they're not startups. Uh, you know, we like roll-ups, we provide private equity for growth capital, acquisition financing, all these companies to grow. We also have an affiliate which we work with that provides debt financing for uh, basically all kinds of projects, whether corporate projects or real estate projects. Very aggressive debt financing program. I think we talked about it for brief. Yeah, we did the other day. Yeah. Yeah. Providing 90% LTV. So if you want to buy a company for $100 million, as long as you can put in $10 million of equity or in the form of an SPLC, mm -hmm. we will provide you with 90% in debt financing. So we are, we're, we're providers of capital, both equity financing and debt financing for companies that want to grow. That's on the private equity side. Mm -hmm. We don't invest in stocks, in bonds. We don't do that. That's one. On the, on the physical commodities trading side, we basically focus on three commodities which we trade physically, gold, oil derivatives, and iron ore. You know, a uh, lot, lot of uh, suppliers, I mean, we supply big corporations, we trade with uh, uh, governments, individuals, these physical commodities. Uh, very profitable business. Uh, I really think these two businesses have the highest margins, you know, re return-wise, profit-wise. That's what we do. I mean, we're very focused in what we do. And uh, we're here pretty much in the wealth creation process. Wealth creation through Blackhawk Partners and uh, empowerment through the Financial Policy Council. I'm, by the way, writing also my second book. I think you'll be pleased to hear that, Fabrizio. Great. It's coming up the first quarter of 2019. Uh -huh. It's called Stupid Startups, uh -huh. how, how Ego and Incompetence Tank Ventures. <laughs> I'm talking about all these egomaniacs yeah. who are very confident, whether they are venture capitalists or entrepreneurs. What they have missed, and I'm giving case examples, what they have missed, how do you really build a company, how do you finance a company, and they are equally to blame, both the venture capitalists and the entrepreneurs. You know, it's not like the venture capitalists know it all. No, a lot of them are really much rookies. 99%, frankly, are rookies. They don't know what they're doing. They ended up with a part of capital mm -hmm. to allocate. Mm -hmm. uh, and the entrepreneurs, the same thing. You know, they really think that their, their product is like, you know, they are God's gift to earth. <laughs> you know, that their product is so unique and they're so special. 
It's not the case. Not everybody's like that. There are people like that, but not everybody's like that. So basically, the book is um, exposes them, mm -hmm. calls mm -hmm. for action. Mm -hmm. uh, I think there was a huge swamp in the financial service industry. The same thing there was in like, DC. Yeah. You know, people, people clinging to power and clinging to their old way of doing business. Mm -hmm. I want to drain the swamp. You said you said something very interesting, Zia. This thing of clinging to the old way of doing business. I find that everything seems to be accelerating. And if we don't accelerate our minds and our self-development yeah. at the same rate technology is, is evolving and accelerating, we're going to fall behind. And we're going to see a lot of people that were out there in the limelight suddenly in the slumps because they, they, they said, oh, I, I know how to do this. I've been doing this for 30 years. When I hear people say that, I like I cringe. Because, I mean, there's some kids now, 22, 23 years old, with a startup. And, you know, and, and look at the guys at Instagram. They walked away with a billion dollars after 18 months. And they only had 13 employees. That's what I'm saying. That's what I'm saying. Power is changing. What I said before. Yeah. And uh, cannot underestimate these people. This is why I said all what I focus on, Fabrizio, is people. Yeah. It's not the industries. I don't care about the industry, but you have a 30-year-old guy, a 22-year-old guy who comes up with something, Do you th a super genius. Do you think I'm going to care about what industry is in? This guy is building something super scalable. You remember what I said? Scalable. Yeah. Scalable. Scale the game. Building that. These are the kind of people I look for. Look, you know, I I'm not like a fund trying to spend all my money, uh, all my time raising money. Yeah. No, the money is here. I'm trying to spend my time finding these gems. These people who I'm going to back, who are going to revolutionize the industry, who are entrepreneurs, who are game changers. And the Financial Policy Council is the platform to bring about the magnet, those entrepreneurs, to forward, to explain themselves, to empower them. You know, the world needs more people like that, like Steve Jobs. The world needs, the world needs less of corporate America, of corporate world. Because these guys are cl are clipping your wings. They're not empowering you. You are here a threat to them. So they're not here to empower you. They're here to break you. It's the reality. The people think, oh, you know what? I work for a big corporation. I get my paycheck. Yeah, you get your paycheck. You're never going to get wealthy. You're, you're, you're their corporate slaves. Yeah. You know, four years. So I'm trying to change. So I'm telling you, there's a swamp. And then they're very entrenched. The same thing in politics. You know, entrench all this old establishment in D.C. Until now, things are starting to change, and hopefully they will change. Yeah. But the same thing happens in the financial services sector. You know, as venture capitalists, as entrepreneurs, etc. Silicon Valley has a very arrogant and obnoxious way of doing business, and they think they know it all, and they think they are the center of the world, just because they backed in the past a couple of very interesting ventures. But now, it's emerging. I remember what I said before. Different points of influence. Uh, Israel is a high tech center. Dubai is going into a high tech center. Hong Kong, all over the place. This uh, emerging all over the world. So they have the decentralization of power, of capital, of everything. Yeah. And this is what this is what you have to be aware of and not stick to the old ways of doing business because it's it's not going to go very far. Because this is how you're going to start feeling you're getting old. You see, you start feeling you're getting old when you talk about the past. Oh, I used to be like this. I used to be like that. Mm -hmm. You keep young by saying the best is yet to come. And I'm still very young. I have a lot of things to conquer. No, seriously. Yeah. I mean, it, it's the whole attitude thing. You know, and unfortunately, I see, I know I, I do it because I, you know, get in touch with a lot of people. I'm yeah. you know, very active on social media. Who tell me, yeah, you know, it's a brush of fresh air, fresh air, what you're saying, you know, because you're inspiring me to think differently. You know, I mean, they tell me, you know, I'm in my 50s. Like, What's 50? What's 60? Yeah. David Rockefeller died at 101 yeah. and he was still working and he doesn't need to work. He's a Rockefeller. Yeah, of course. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> he doesn't need to work, you yeah. know, he's doing it because it made him feel, I'm not telling you, I mean, this is the whole thing. It made him feel young active, etc. If we had more people in the world to think like this, the world would be a different place. And if we have even the politicians now converted to business people, the world would be a different place because they would look at their economic interests, like North Korea. When they, if this guy, Kim Jong-un, starts thinking, 
starts thinking, whenever when he starts thinking business, everything would change. Well, Trump everything said to him <laughs> when Trump was over there, he said, oh, you could build a, get a few nice hotels on the beach here. And that would bring in some tourists I immediately with his real estate eye. He immediately saw the opportunity. Hopefully the guy listened. Uh, but what a lot yeah. of people don't know is that the guy in North Korea, he actually went to school in Switzerland and not many people know that. Uh, so he yeah. has been educated in the Western way. So he's not this big monster that the mainstream media portray him as. He's quite a smart guy. And uh, sure. yeah, and, and I think Trump and him got on very well. So we'll, we'll see what happens there. But that, that may be an interesting market to invest in. Um, you know, some real estate in, in North Korea. But talking about technology, Vietnam, the Vietnamese government are very, very into technology and robotics. And they have a very young population as well that are into technology. So the, one of the new Silicon Valleys could actually be Vietnam too, as well as the other places you mentioned. Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, there are a lot of new frontiers opening up and you just have to keep your eyes open. But you know what? When you look at a frontier, again, you look at the people. Yeah. Let, 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 me, let, me, get, let me give you an example. Mm -hmm. okay? Let me give you an example of how I uh, operate when I go to emerging markets. Mm -hmm. When I go to emerging markets, a lot of people go there, like any emerging market, you cycle. They go there, they start networking slowly, they go and meet the, uh, the Chamber of Commerce and this and that, and they start making contacts. I don't operate like this. This is not how Black Hawk operates. You know mm -hmm. how I operate? I go and look, for example, China. Mm -hmm. I go and look at all the Chinese who graduated from the top five U.S. business schools, Harvard, Wharton, Stanford, MIT, Princeton, etc. I go to the directory. I saw who are all the graduates, Chinese born from these five colleges. These are the people I tap. So now you're tapping people who are US trained, who are back home, who think like you and I, who are very competitive, because they went to these top colleges. Exactly. And you understand the language of business. Yeah. And I'm telling you, these guys are the guys. This is the elite. It's not the people empowering government. This is the elite. These are going to be the next captains of finance and industry in those emerging markets. They speak the local language, whether Indian or Chinese or whatever it is, or yeah. Singaporean. Yeah. They are US trained. They are very savvy. They're very competitive. They know what deadline means. You know, a lot of the other guys, you know, like, especially the Arab world, inshallah, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. God's will, things will happen. Yeah. You know, okay. there's nothing to do with that. They know that they have to finish this task, this day, this time. So, so they are very competitive. This is the kind of guys I gather yep. in one evening and I guess start networking with them and I start building with them and knowing what their agenda is, etc. You now are, from day one, you're getting to the top of the heap. You're dealing with the absolute brightest people who are going to make a difference. A lot of them will end up in government, yeah. running governments, running this and that. But uh, that's a simple example. You know, that's a maverick way of going after it and tapping into the people because, again, it's all about people. Yes, I, I agree 100%, 100%. Very, very smart way of doing things. Thank you, Ziad. It's been great having you on the show. When your book's published, we need to have you on again uh, to have a Absolutely. chat about that because it sounds very, very interesting. Um, everybody that's been watching, I mean, we'll be posting below the links to Financial Policy Council and Black Hawk Partners so you can contact Ziad. Uh, Ziad's a rebel. He thinks outside the box. He's very modern and forward thinking. It's always a pleasure talking to you, Ziad and finding out about your insights and what you're up to. It's, it's great. You always, always deliver valuable content and it's a pleasure to, to be your friend. My pleasure, Fabrizio. All the okay. best. Have a great Th weekend. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.